stand with me as we come together, together our hearts to worship the Lord. We'll begin this morning with a reading from God's Word. Jesus, uh, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus continues to preach. This is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single cubit to his, to his height by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In our prayer time this morning, I'm going to invite the Blundell family to come down. This week, they will be traveling to Zambia for two weeks to work in an orphanage there with missionaries that they uh, are good friends with. And as we always do when we send a group out, uh, we want to pray for them um, as a church family. So I'm going to ask that you would join me as we pray, begin our worship service together. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for families that seek first your kingdom and that live that out by going onto the mission field. Father, we pray for the Blundells as they travel. We pray for their time on the field there in Zambia as they work with the children and the missionaries. Father, we pray that you'd bless that time with your presence, with your power. Fill each one of them with your Holy Spirit that they could do uh, works for you that are beyond our imagination. Father, that you in the end would receive glory and power and honor and praise. Father, we pray for your servants. Lord, we pray for our time together this morning as a church as we gather to worship you and honor you and bring glory to your name for the work that you have done in our life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. You bet. God bless. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing a new song? We sang it, I think, last week at the close, and it's called I Got Saved, a new one by Selah. Let's sing that together. There is a river of gladness Pours from Emmanuel's veins Sinner was plunged Beneath the flood and God saved Since then I walk in forgiveness all of my guilt was erased The chains of the past Broke. Broken at last I got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right he got a hold of my life for God, Jesus, could I want more? I perceive nothing but goodness, tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and God saved. Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy 
forward for our morning offering. Yes, the service is a little different this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for this day. We praise you for this hour. Time that we can come before you and sing praises to you. That we can also give of what you have so blessed us with in our tithes and offerings this morning. Father, we just pray that it would go for the ongoing of the ministry here and around the world. We love and praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
hopefully you'll get why we're flipping things a little bit this morning. If you have your Bible open to Romans chapter 11, we're going to stand upon the mountain that Paul has written about through the first 11 chapters of this letter to the Romans, the Roman believers. This great theological work of Paul, the great doctrinal teaching that Paul has laid out, that we have worked through. We're at the top of that mountain, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul has slowly ascended that mountain in writing, and it is without error. It's completely true in all ways, full of divine truth, and Paul now stands at the top of that mountain, and at the top of that mountain, we look back over the terrain which he has climbed, uh, and we consider all the implications that Paul has laid out in the first 11 chapters, all the things that he has set forward for us in the church in the 21st century, as good as it was in the first century, 20 centuries ago, it comes to this dynamic doxology, this dynamic time of praise to God by Paul before he jumps into all the practical stuff starting in chapter 12, which is how we actually live all of this out. He stops and he says, hmm, I think I need to praise the Lord for a minute. And this is what we're looking at this morning, verses 33 through 30, 36. It's a, it's a genuine praise coming from Paul's heart. He does this in many of his letters, if not all of his letters, somewhere there's some kind of moment where he just gets so overwhelmed, he bursts into this, uh, just a verse or two verses of praise, a doxology of praising and glorifying God. And what we see in this doxology is, is the depth of God's character that we have looked at from chapter 1, verse 17, to chapter 11, verse 32. So if you have your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 33. And the first thing we want to look at is what Paul points out here, is that God has superior wisdom. There is a superior a superiority to His wisdom in everything. Look at verse 33. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. That first word, oh, it's not just like, oh, by the way, oh. No, it's a, it's a holy moly guacamole. I mean, it's the real deal. It's deep down in his soul, deep down in his gut. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Beloved, God has a vast knowledge. And to use the English word indescribable does not describe it. Our language really has no word for then we could describe His wisdom and His glory. Paul uses the word depth. It's depth to an extreme degree. Inexhaustibly deep. Profound. He uses the word riches. It's not coins in your pocket or in your piggy bank. But rather the wealth, the overwhelming nature of His mercy and His kindness and His grace. There's more than we need. It's wealth. There's wisdom. That's a practical wisdom. That God, in His decisions and in His judgments and His decrees, He knows exactly what He's doing because He is full of wisdom. And then He's got knowledge. And we've learned that knowledge from chapter 1, verse 17, all the way to chapter 11, verse 32. And how He planned to save creation. How He planned to save man who is full of sin. Think of it this way when it comes to depth. A diver can only go down so far into the ocean before the capacities of the human body are tested beyond breaking point. We're made to operate when you dive down only in a certain depth of water. And beyond that, the pressure is too much to bear and it will crush you. Same thing with a submarine. It can only go so deep before it is crushed like a tin can. So it is with the depth of God's wisdom and God's knowledge. We cannot bear what He can, nor can we follow in His path, because He is God and we are not. He has revealed to us everything we need to know in this book. There is nothing more we need to know about Him that is not in this book. It's all here. It is complete without error. This is the depth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God that we have. And those ways, His ways, are beyond us. They're unsearchable. His judgments there are the the way that He runs the world. 
His path is untraceable. Now, if you're a, a deer hunter or any kind of hunter at all, and you've ever slightly missed a shot and the animal didn't fall right away, there's something that you have to do. You have to go find where that animal was standing when you shot, and hopefully you'll find a trace of evidence. And then you start following that blood path, eventually hoping to find the animal lying there dead at some point. But we can't do that with God's ways. We can't do that with His wisdom. We can follow here and we follow what He's laid out for us, but there's something much more untraceable to that. And the, and the, the great thing is, is that there is no man-made religion that can even come close to the beauty and the depth and the width of God's grace. There's a lot of Christians today that are a mile wide and an inch deep, but beloved, our God, and it is exhaustively wide and inexhaustibly deep. And that's how He wants us to be as we grow in Christ. In the context of Romans, listen to where we've been. In chapter 1, Paul wrote that salvation comes through the Gospel. For I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation for everyone who believes. In chapter 2, we learn there how the work of the law is in the heart of man. In chapter 3, we learn there about the sinfulness of man compared to the law. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In chapter 4, we learn how like Abraham being there, the example that God imputes righteousness to us without our work. Because it says Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. He had faith in his God who called him out of his home. In chapter 5, we have presented to us the plan of atonement, which means that Jesus would be the substitute for us upon the cross. Sin came in through the first man, that's Adam. Sin is forgiven, it's paid for, by the substitute, Christ, the second man. In chapter 6, we learn of the new life in Christ, that we were dead in sin, but now we are alive to God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In chapter 7, we learn that the sin principle still resides in us, but in Christ we have hope and victory over temptation and over sin. In chapter 8, Paul clearly lays out once again the plan of salvation. And that once you are in the plan of salvation, once you are in Christ, there is no power in heaven, on earth, or under the earth that can snatch you from the love of God. In chapter 9, we learn that there is a, a group known as the children of promise. And it's those who are in Christ by faith. If you are in Christ by faith, you are a child of promise. That means you are inheriting the promises of God that He promised Abraham so long ago. In chapter 10, we learned again that salvation is not by works. That's where Israel messed up. They were trying to work for it, but God said, no, it's salvation is by faith and by faith alone. In chapter 11, we've learned that God is working both Jew and Gentile, bringing them both to salvation. And this brings a point in Paul's heart where he stops and he says, how great are your works, O Lord, how great are your thoughts? Your thoughts are very deep, Psalm 92.5. Your thoughts are very deep. We don't fully understand some of the concepts like election. There are people who think they do. And they can think that all they want. But election is something that's very deep and very complicated. We may under, understand the hardening that God has put in the hearts of some to reject His salvation, only to let some come in and then now open those hardened hearts again. We may not understand that entire plan. We certainly don't always understand God's timetable and how He works. We want to, but we don't. The riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God are too deep for us. And that has led Paul to a place where he must glorify and worship the Lord. Beloved, God has used everything He has used every bit of the story to make it contribute to the ultimate goal He has determined from centuries, eternity, past. He has made the sin of man to fall upon the One who knew no sin. That He would be the payment for our sin. He made the death of Christ the propitiation or the the payment for the sins of the world. He even made the rejection of Israel. And fashioned it in such a way that it would lead to the Gospel going to the Gentiles so that you and I could be here today and pray now for Israel so that they too would receive the Gospel in the same way that we have. 
the whole work of redemption, the whole work of God in His Son Christ is all manifest in His wisdom. It all shows His wisdom. That kind of plan cannot fit into the scheme of man. It cannot fit into our thought, into our scheme. We cannot make that kind of stuff up. This is a God who loves His creation and is paid for it. No other God, no other false God, no other idol, no other uh, religion has a God like our God. We look at verses 34 and 35 and Paul pointing us to God's supremacy. God's supremacy. Look at verses 34 and 35. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? We have an inability to properly comprehend God and His ways. Paul quotes one more time from Isaiah. Maybe his favorite prophet. Old Testament to prophet to quote from. But in Isaiah 40, the context there that Paul was quoting out of is, is Isaiah marveling at God's grace, His future grace for Israel as God would bring them back from Babylon after 70 years in captivity and exile. And he's marveling at God's grace because in that, God is promising the forgiveness of sin. And Isaiah is marveling at the fact that God would forgive their sin. The wonder of that forgiveness. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah capturing the words of God here where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and your thoughts than my thoughts. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been His counselor? Paul continues there to another church in his writing, the church of Corinth, where Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? God says. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since... In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God doesn't need a counselor. You're not going to look up in the Gonzales Inquirer this week in the classifieds and see an ad that says, Wanted, personal advisor, see God. Send your resume to the church and let them pass it on for you. There's nothing, there's nothing like that. He's never needed that assistant, that management consultant to help him. He's never needed a calendar app to know what's going on, to remind him that, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday today or so-and-so needs rain. He doesn't need those kind of things. He doesn't need anyone to help him rule or rescue the world. He is God. There's no special counsel. And if he needed a special counsel or a secretary of state or something, they wouldn't pass muster anyway. When they went before the Senate. Okay. He has no heavenly advisor. There's nobody there. No one qualified. No one is high enough or deep enough to know the ways of God. Who has knowledge enough of all that is involved in the present or what will happen tomorrow to be the advisor and the counselor of God? Paul says in verse 35, he quotes now from Job, another great Old Testament story. In Job chapter 41, verse 11. Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Job had endured a great loss in his life. He lost everything. Everything but his wife and some some friends. And the friends tried to just... Job cursed God and died. Just end it, dude. This is is pathetic. It's terrible watching you go through this. Just curse God and end it all, Job. Well, Job kind of reaches the end of his sanity here, and he starts questioning God about these things. And Job 41 is the second time he's questioning God. And before God says this in chapter 41, Job realizes, I need to shut up. I talked to you once, Lord. You answered. I I said it again, and and now I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be small. I'm going to listen. And so in Job 41, God's second speech to Job, he is facing Job. He's putting before Job the awesome terror of of the Leviathan. 
But we can make up lots of things about the Leviathan. Most people think that's a reference to some kind of dinosaur or some kind of great ocean beast that everyone knew of back then. And so here is this awesome terror, and, and, and Job is being faced with this by God, and, and God simply says to him, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And now he's talking to himself. Job, can you go handle the Leviathan? Can you get your cane pole and put a worm on your hook, cast it out there in the water, hook that Leviathan and pull him in and eat him for dinner tonight? Fish fry tonight, by the way, at 530. It's not Leviathan, though. (laughs) Job, can you do that? Job, I don't think you can do that. But Job, guess who gave the Leviathan his life? Guess who tells the Leviathan where to swim? Guess who tells the Leviathan when to die? And then, then God's saying here, Job, what? Have you ever given a gift to me that I would need to repay you? I mean, you don't say to God, wow, God, I went to church today. You owe me one now, dude. You're on the hook. You owe me for that. It was my only day off this week. That's the only day I work, so there you go. I mean... (laughs) You owe me, God. You owe me for that one. I went on that mission trip. You owe me. I gave four hours every morning during vacation Bible school. You owe me. God, that was a big check I put in the offering plate this morning. You owe me. Where's my blessing tenfold? I planted a seed of faith. Where's my blessing? Get it? Job 41.11 pokes a hole in the prosperity gospel, by the way. That's a side note. Off my soapbox. You don't say to God, God, you owe me. Here's what Paul is arguing. Can you think like God? Can you advise God? Does God owe you? And the answer to all of those is no. But sometimes in our life we think, we might even say, that God is wrong. How can we say that God isn't just? Well, we see injustice and we somehow blame that on God. That's not His fault. It's man and our sin that causes injustice. We might say, well, God isn't fair. Well, as my daddy says, life's hard, then you die. Why do we say things like, oh, old Billy Bob left this earth too soon. He had so many more days ahead of him. Do you know when you say things like that, you're saying that what which Psalm 139, which says that God has our days numbered, you're saying that God is wrong. God has your days numbered. He's sovereign over that. He doesn't give you one less day or one more day. God has your days numbered. And when we say things like that, we're saying God is wrong. Do you know the mind of God? Do you think like Him? Do you advise Him? Do you owe God? Or does God owe you? The key to understanding all of this is what we just went through. Chapter 1, verse 17, all the way to chapter 11, verse 32. Job says, again, in another part of Job, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? It is, it, its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Psalm 36, verse 6, Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. Psalm 97, 2, Clouds and thick darkness are all around Him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. Ephesians 3, 19, To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Verse 20, To know Him, who now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, or think according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our God is superior. And He is supreme. Verse 36, we see here God's self-sufficiency. Look at verse 36. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. The last statement is given. This is the reason why we will always owe God and that God is never indebted to us. Look at this again. From Him. That means that God is the source. He is the great source of all things. The Creator. The Initiator. Nothing exists apart from Him. Through Him, which means He is the agent. That agency points to God as the great sustainer of all things. He is the power behind everything. And then there is to Him, which means that God is the goal. It points to God as the great goal, the last end of all things. 
The ultimate purpose, the ultimate end of everything is found in God, and the goal of everything is God. The chief end of man is not the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. The chief end of man is the pursuit of the glory of God. He's run with passion and live to His glory. That's the doctrinal message of Romans, and it leads Paul to worship. All of salvation from its origin and eternity, first mentioned to us in Genesis 3.15, to its consummation in the new creation, as mentioned in the book of Revelation, is a grace, is grace alone. And it is by the sacrifice of Christ alone. It is mediated to men and women by the Spirit of God alone. And it is received empty-handed by faith alone. And it is because, because it is all without exception from His grace, it is all without exception to His glory. Beloved, don't doubt His plan. Don't doubt His purposes. Don't doubt His decision. Don't doubt His timing. Don't doubt His guidelines. Don't doubt His truth. We have to seek Him. We have to submit to Him. And we have to honor Him. Guess what? That all starts next week when we open up the rest of the story. We have to seek and worship and praise God in truth. So says Jesus in John 4. And you can't worship the Lord without truth. If you don't have truth, you're worshiping the wrong God. That's why Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, worship happens in spirit and in truth. We don't have to understand and know everything to praise the God who does. That's where Paul ends. When we come to worship the Lord, we come with hearts centered on the Lord because all glory belongs to Him. All glory. And I want to invite you I want to invite you to join me in a renewed commitment to just praise the Lord. Just praise Him. Praise Him. Y'all go ahead and start making your way forward. We just want to praise God. We just want to worship Him. We want to worship Him in time, and we want to worship Him in eternity. There's only one way that you can really worship in time and eternity, and that is to be in Christ. If you are not in Christ, then I'm going to invite you to join Him this morning. As Amber begins to softly play, I'm going to invite you to enjoy and enjoy and join your life with Christ. He died on the cross to save you from your sin, to pay for your sin, and He rose from the dead so that today, by believing in Him through faith, you would receive a brand new start, a new life. You would be a new creation. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you need to receive Him this morning, before we worship Him. And I'm going to invite you to follow and pray as I do. To get a fresh start, a forgiveness of sins. To have Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. If you need to receive Him this morning, then you pray as I do. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and that God raised you from the dead. I trust and surrender to you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will. In your name I pray. Amen. As you stand, pray that this morning, I'm going to invite you to come down right now, and we want to celebrate that as a family, as a church, because we are called to celebrate when one comes home, or two, or three. If you're not ready to make that public yet, then you pray about that, and you pray that God will change your heart. You bow your head and close your eyes and continue to prepare your heart for worship this morning.
Father, you are a good God. As we get ready to worship you, Lord, as Paul did, Father, I pray our hearts are ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for the one that's come this morning to recommit his life to you. We praise you for that. Father, we thank you for the promise, the promise of the forgiveness of sin and a fresh start, a cleansing from all unrighteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, church, let's worship together this morning as we all stand and sing every day. What to say, Lord, it's you gave me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now. But you say, me, Lord, you're all I am to you every day. I can be alive to your name. Every day. Stand upon your word and pray that I, I may come to know you more. You would guide me in every single step I take, every day I can be a light unto your world every day. To you I live for every day. I follow after you every day. I walk with you, my Step I take every day, I can be a light unto your world every day. It's you I live for every day. I follow after you every day. I walk with you, my Lord. Every day, it's you I live for. Walk with you, my Lord. To you I live for every day. To you I live for every day. To you I live for every day.
announcements for you before we depart. This evening, 5.30, fish fry. Uh, if you are interested in helping cook or want to see how all that's done, 2 o'clock, right outside. Uh, if it's raining, they'll be over here by the canopy. If it's not, they'll be across the street uh, cooking. And uh, as long as you promise not to eat too much in the taste testing, that's all good, all right? Uh, oh, that is the point, but we can't tell everybody that's the point. For everyone will show up to help cook, and we'll have nothing at 530. All right. All right, so uh, come and be a part of that this evening, 530. We'll be in the fellowship hall. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with that is, it's uh, the next building over with a brown awning out front. And uh, we want to have you here. You might bring a side or a dessert. That's fine. We'll have, uh, I believe, hush, we have any hush puppies, Keith? Where are you? There you are. Hush puppies, fries, fish and shrimp, and all the good stuff with it. So you want to be a part of that. Come and be fellowshipping together. It's all about fellowship tonight. Uh, Kevin has an announcement about our, our revamped church website. I would like for you to see our new website. If you would show that on the big screen, hopefully it pops up there. Oh, looky there. There it is. And so uh, we have completely redone the website. Uh, and uh, you scroll, uh, if you can scroll down, uh, it'll sh it shows you where you can maybe, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. Uh, it has all the mission statement. Keep going up, keep going up. And uh, it has links that you can click on for our children, youth, guests, etc. You can register for Camp Sunshine. Also, you can see the latest uh, sermon uh, video, uh, as well as all kinds of other goodies. And uh, that's just the home page. And then you've got all the stuff that's beyond that. Also, at the very top of the home page, those of you who would like to do online giving, we now have online giving. We have entered a new era. And uh, so hopefully it's not an error, but an error. Uh, and anyway, it'll be great for you, those millennials, that uh, it's like I don't have cash and I don't have a checkbook. All I've got is a debit card. Well, you can do that online as well as link your uh, uh, online account, et cetera, et cetera. It's all secured through Stripe, and uh, it doesn't go to us. It goes to them, and we're, they're a third party for us. And so it uh, looks great. So take the time to go and visit fbcgonzalez.org. All right. Thank you. You did that really quick. Um, That's right. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. We have students going to Super Summer uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we've got eight going uh, um, as that group, and then there'll be another, uh, some others going uh, to a different uh, location for Super Summer. But we want to make sure that uh, we're praying for those who are going um, as well. They'll head out in the morning, be back Friday. Trey and Lexi are also there this week uh, teaching, part of the leadership team there at Howard Payne. So keep those uh, kiddos in your prayers. And uh, we look forward to seeing and hearing great results of how God is working. As you go, may you continue to worship Him today. And let that be your story. That redemption story, it's a story our community needs to hear and our world needs to hear about Jesus Christ. I pray that as you go, you'll grow in His grace and His knowledge and be blessed. You are dismissed. What? Oh, I'll get you next week. I'll get you next week.